it's sometimes difficult to realize that it was only two and a half years ago at the third Aviation Environment Summit that the industry came together in a way that it has rarely done on issues other than maybe safety to really sign the declaration on and um, commitment to dealing with the climate change challenge. And two and a half years ago, I'm not sure we all understood exactly where that would lead us. But we've come a huge way since then, since signing this declaration. This was a declaration where the industry recognized that we do have a challenge. Although we are a key driver of economic activity, a provider of a conduit for trade, tourism, social development and economic development, that does come uh, with some uh, risk and the risk of climate change and the, um, the emissions of CO2 that the industry make if we were to continue on the same path that we were on, would see a significant increase in the future. This chart shows you how we would forecast our emissions to grow if we were not to take any further action between where we are right now and 2030. But we have the confidence, based on our track record, to know that we can make steps. This chart shows you the gap that has, would have been there had we not made steps continually in our history since 1990. If we had continued to operate with the same technology, the same processes as we had in 1990, we would have emitted another 3.3 billion tons of CO2 over that time frame. So this is an industry that has a very strong track record of dealing with these types of issues and reducing um, CO2. Since uh, that declaration two and a half years ago, um, the industry's done a lot of analysis and I do not intend to try and explain all of this to you, but we have a very deep understanding of where we need to act and how we need to act. And having the confidence of our track record and the confidence of uh, knowing exactly what we need to do led us last year to adopting these three very ambitious targets for addressing climate change. The first one between 2010 today and 2020 is to continue to push to improve our fuel efficiency by an average of 1.5% per annum. Now that may not sound a lot, but that's a further 17% improvement in fuel efficiency between now and 2020. From 2020, we committed to carbon neutral growth, meaning that we want to cap our net emissions whilst continuing to be able to develop and grow the industry as we see is going to happen. And then by 2050, to aim to reduce our net emissions by 50% compared to where they were in 2005. Now these are truly ambitious targets. And I think that the industry is united behind these targets in a way that it rarely has before and there is a very, very strong shared commitment to delivering on them. But targets alone are not enough. We need to lay out a clear roadmap of where we're going in terms of trying to deliver on these targets. Because at some point, having announced them, we'll be held accountable for what we have said we want to do. So this chart shows you that if we were to continue doing, you know, if we were to do nothing, we would be on the, on the red line Whereas, in fact, what we've committed to do through our targets is to turn the curve around to the green line. But, of course, the big question is, how do we do that? We know that there are existing technology, operational, and infrastructure improvement opportunities that are already in the pipeline. And they will play a significant role already in bringing down that curve. But we do know that if we want to reach the carbon neutral growth challenge from 2020 and the longer term objective of reducing our emissions by half, that there is a lot more that needs to be done in terms of development, both in, in technology, but also sustainable fuels, um, as we've heard. Each of those targets itself demands a huge amount of commitment, collaboration, and work on behalf of the industry. If we look at the short-term target of 1.5% fuel efficiency, what that translates to between now and 2020 is finding reductions of about 728 
million tons of carbon. And in 2020 alone, that will mean that in that year we have got to have found about 150 million tons of CO2 reductions. Now, with all the analysis that we've done, we know where those reduction opportunities may lie. And you can see here the share of those reduction opportunities that could be contributed by various factors. And I think it's really worth noting here that some of those things are purely within the remit of the industry. Investments in fleet renewal, operational improvements, um, retrofits, etc. All things that the industry can contribute. But there are certain things, particularly in the areas of infrastructure, airspace management and design, where governments have to play an active role. And very often we're asked the question, I was asked this question on Tuesday by a member of the KO Council, so the industry is just talking about government spending more money on air traffic management systems. And of course that's not the only answer, it's not just about money, it's also about political will. It's about making those decisions about the management of airspace, the trade-offs between military and civil airspace, etc., that are really going to make a difference in moving this agenda forward. And of course I think Francois highlighted the importance of sustainable alternative fuels for aviation, and particularly the promise of biofuels. And here again, we must look to governments to help and support the industry in getting this fledgling industry off the ground, in supplying the quantities that we need for uh, civil aviation. That 1.5% per annum translates into the need for 12,000 new aircraft between now and 2020. 5,000 of those aircraft will replace existing planes that are in the fleet, and 7,000 of those aircraft will supply the growth in places like uh, China, India, Latin America, Africa and the Middle East. And that's at a cost of $1.3 trillion to the industry. Governments, as I said, have to play their part in air traffic management. It's not just Cesar next gen. There are opportunities to improve airspace usage and design um, in many, many places around the world. On the second of our targets, carbon neutral growth, this is probably the most crucial one and it's probably the most difficult one and it's certainly politically the most contentious one. Carbon neutral growth means capping our net emissions from 2020 but we have to do that with a combination of measures. There is not a silver bullet to these issues. We have to work across the board with a combination of technology, including alternative fuels, operational efficiencies, infrastructure improvements, and economic measures, both in terms of positive incentives and the opportunity to offset some of those emissions in the medium term. So looking again at the emissions roadmap and looking further forward, we've identified that, that alternative fuels, and particularly biofuels, are a big opportunity. Two and a half years ago, when we signed that declaration, biofuels and alternative fuels were still something of a dream. And since then, they've become a reality. We've flown planes, we know that they work, we know that we can use them as drop-in fuels. The certification process is, is proceeding by the end of the first quarter of 2011. Those fuels will be available for aviation. The challenge now is about commercialization and scaling up, and that is a big challenge. And there we don't only need the collaboration of industry, including fuel suppliers, but we also need the support of governments in terms of interpreting policy to support the development of that industry. And let's not you know, fool ourselves, it is a huge challenge, it is a massive, massive challenge, but it's also a big opportunity. This is a study that was done for the UK government's Climate Change Commission by E4Tech. And in their best case scenario, they see biofuels replacing the whole of aviation fuel supply by 2050. In the worst case scenario, about 40% over that time frame. So there is a huge margin of, of difference, but it is a huge opportunity. And again here, as I said, governments have got to play their part and support the industry in moving forward. 
Let me just finally talk a little bit about market-based measures. You heard from Christiana Figueres that the UNFCCC sees market-based measures as a major component and a key component of everything that we try and do. And the industry has always said that we support the idea of market-based measures. But it cannot just be in terms of taxes and levies. We need positive incentives to encourage investment um, and research and development in new technologies, etc. Um, and we recognize that in the medium term, we may need offsets in order to get us to our target of carbon neutral growth. You heard from both President Kobe Gonzalez and also from Christiana Figueres that what we need is a global approach to dealing with these issues. Aviation and marine uh, shipping, maritime shipping, are both industries that are truly global in nature. That's why they were singled out separately under the Kyoto Protocol. And so there is a very strong recognition, and in all the discussions we've had with governments, they all agree we need a global framework. The problem is that what we're seeing emerging is a very, very different picture to that. We're seeing a fragmented approach. And this fragmented approach is leading to conflicting policy approaches through different types of systems, be that emissions trading or taxation and levies. And in some places, particularly here in Europe, a layering of different measures that are basically double counting and double charging for the same emissions. This is not a picture that can be um, acceptable to any industry, and even politicians admit that this is not the right way to go, but we are increasingly seeing um, these types of, of uh, activities coming forward, particularly given the pressure on treasuries um, following the recession. That global framework, and we've articulated, it needs to be based on some really sound principles, and some of these principles have been recognized and included in the deliberations that ICAO is uh, moving forward on. Things like making sure that our emissions are only ac are accounted for, but accounted for once. That we, we, we have equal treatment of operators on routes. That we make sure that emissions are dealt with not purely through economic measures, but we must continue the pressure on technological, operational, and infrastructure improvements. That we as an industry do need access to carbon markets and that if there are any revenues from any of those market-based uh, activities, we would like to see those revenues reinvested to help the industry reach its goals. There is a huge political divide in looking at, this, at these issues, and bridges must be built. And, but we do believe that under the Chicago Convention, ICAO has the tools to deal with these types of differences to address the differing needs of states, be they developing or developed countries. And so we're encouraging ICAO to have the confidence to move forward and build some bridges as we go ahead. So the industry is not sitting and waiting for a policy framework. We've set our targets and we're moving towards them. There is a huge amount of activity and a massive acceleration in activity that's happened over the last couple of years in really trying to move this forward. And I think that is a very strong message that we need to send uh, to people, that we are very actively uh, moving forward on this issue.